Good afternoon. It's good to be with you, and I um, uh, appreciate all of you being here and uh, being here for this evening uh, afternoon service. And I want you to turn in your Bible back to Acts chapter 15. Uh, <clears throat> going to look at what we looked at this morning and uh, doing it the way that uh, I've done it the past several times uh, when I can't be with you in the evening service and we'll just uh, continue on and uh, pre-record uh, what we would have done uh, uh, in person. Now, I probably mentioned this morning that Amy had a very bad migraine uh, yesterday evening and, and through the night. And it did not go away, and so uh, I had to um, uh, rework some things uh, for the, the morning service. And uh, I'm not sure if I'll be in Workworth uh, this afternoon when I actually play this or not. So I may be here in person, and if so, I'm going to have to endure my own preaching. Um, that, that's pretty pretty bad. But anyway, um, <clears throat> please keep praying for Amy. Pray that she gets uh, feeling better. And uh, if I'm not here then I'm probably over with Amy and uh, making sure that the children behave, all right? But um, uh, please pray for Amy that uh, she will get, get better and get over this uh, migraine. And uh, appreciate everyone uh, pulling together, amen, to uh, uh, keep our ministry going, amen? All right. Well, let's, um, let's look at Acts chapter 15. And Lord willing, uh, we were able to go through uh, the first part of this this morning. Uh, we'll look at a few more verses. But um, I'll review for those of you that, that weren't here. And, of course, I'm preaching this uh, beforehand. I'm uh, putting uh, the cart uh, before the horse, so to speak. Uh, but hopefully we uh, hooked up to a good horse this morning. Amen? All right. We, we will have. All right? So anyway, Acts chapter 15, and we've looked at the end of the chapter, uh, end of chapter 14. Uh, that's the end of the uh, first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. And uh, they had a very successful ministry in that. Uh, the Lord truly blessed them. And uh, we've, we've looked at that the past two or three weeks. Chapter 15 uh, is uh, not, not a parenthesis, but it's a, uh, you would say a delay, it's a, a sidestep uh, from the mission work. And we see why uh, right there in verse 1. It says that certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So right away we see that there's false doctrine being presented, and the church had to deal with that. And uh, brought out this morning that uh, any time that you see false doctrine, uh, you see division in the church, then you see the mission work of the church, the evangelism, um, the, the whole purpose of the church come to a halt. And uh, there's no better example of that than Calvinism. Uh, just uh, two or three months ago, I met the first Calvinist I've ever met that was evangelistic. <laughs> uh, you don't normally see those two together. Uh, normally, the Calvinist uh, uses their doctrine as an excuse not to evangelize. And uh, thankfully, when I talked to this Calvinist and explained to him uh, the errors of that, then he recanted it. And he said, I I'm happy to be wrong. Uh, he was very excited to, to be uh, uh, taught differently. And, and so uh, he wasn't a true Calvinist, all right? But uh, Calvinism is a, a perfect example of that, that when um, an elitism comes in or a prejudice, um, uh, anything that adds to grace, then it takes away from the work of the church. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to stop the work. It's going to cause division. That's exactly what happened here. Uh, you see in verse 2, chapter 15, uh, Therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas, that certain of them should go up to Jerusalem and be apostles and elders about this question. And those words there, dissension and disputation, uh, the idea is riot. <laughs> uh, it's not just they had a, an argument about this, although there was probably a lots of arguing, uh, knowing the apostle Paul, but there was, there was a riot in the, in the church. When you talk about a church fight, this was a major church fight. And, of course, it didn't just involve the church in Antioch. Uh, it involved the church in Jerusalem. And so now they're going, and it says to go up to Jerusalem. If you remember on our map back here that 
geographically, Antioch is north, all right? So uh, when the Bible talks about going up to Jerusalem, no matter where you're coming from, north, south, east, or west, it's speaking of the altitude. Jerusalem is built on a, on a hill. It's a city on a hill, all right? And um, that's one reason David built it there. Uh, it could be well fortified at those, uh, you know, years and years ago. And so uh, they also about going up to Jerusalem. It's, it's altitude, not, not direction, okay? And so they're going to go south to Jerusalem and go up uh, on the mount to uh, meet together. And that's exactly what we looked at in the first part of this chapter. And we saw how uh, Peter gave testimony, uh, how the Lord had used him with the, how, at the house of Cornelius and seeing Gentiles saved. And uh, Peter gave a wonderful defense of uh, grace by faith. Amen. Of course, then Paul and Barnabas were there, and they gave their testimonies of how God had used them among the Gentiles in Asia Minor and reaching those in Galatia. Um, I mentioned last week that this was the time, and I probably mentioned this morning, this is the time period where Paul likely wrote the letter to the Galatians, which is the, the book of Galatians in our Bible. And uh, the reason for that was because these teachings were being presented into those young churches in Galatia. And we see that uh, the book of Galatians is a wonderful defense of salvation by grace, uh, that Christ is the end of the law, and there's no need for circumcision. There's no need for uh, justification by works. And so uh, it is all by faith, amen, by grace, through faith. And so Paul wrote that letter, and he didn't mention the council of Jerusalem. Uh, you would think that if he'd written the letter to the Galatians after this council, he would have referenced them, but he did not. And so that's why most people believe that he wrote it before this council took place. Uh, he immediately went on the defense for those young churches uh, while they were still in Antioch. But they come down to Jerusalem, they make their defense, and now we want to look at, uh, let's go to verse 14, and we're going to read several verses here. And uh, let's see, let's go to verse... And let's, let's just start there. It says, Then all the multitude, uh, chapter 15 and verse 12, Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. So now we're going to have the uh, uh, reply of James, which he was the uh, elder of the church. He was the pastor there at the church in Jerusalem. Uh, this is James, the Lord's brother, all right, the uh, man who wrote the book of James in our Bible. Uh, he says, verse 16, after this, I will return, uh, let's see, uh, verse 15, uh, and agree to the words of the prophets as it is written. I'm sorry, go back, we skipped verse 14. All right, here we go, all right. Uh, <clears throat> verse 14, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from among, you, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then it pleased the, the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And we'll stop our reading there. But we see this decision, and uh, it's decision, of course, the whole church uh, uh, agrees with this. All right, we see that in verse 22. It pleased the apostles, the elders, the whole church. But uh, James gives this kind of conclusive uh, declaration. That's what we want to see here this, morning, uh, this afternoon, the declaration uh, made here by the council. What was the decision? And... Uh, James respects the testimony of Paul, Barnabas, uh, and Peter, but then he gives uh, th this other side of it, okay, like the flip side of the coin. And, and what is this? Verse uh, 20 and 21. 
that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. And then he gives a reason for it. Moses of old uh, hath uh, in every city them that preach him. So, so, Pastor, is he adding something to it? And, and is this relevant for us today? Well, uh, no and yes. All right? He's not adding anything to salvation. Uh, it is relevant for us today, though. And that's what we want to see. Why, why is this, or how is this relevant for us today? And uh, what, what is, you know, how do we interpret this? And so, uh, what the Lord is trying to teach us uh, from what happened here in the uh, early church, the first church in Jerusalem, and set the precedent for all the churches then, all right, uh, is that we are saved by grace, number one, and we saw that this morning. Uh, but second of all, we are called to separate from the world. And not only be separated from the world, but then to be separated unto our brethren, or what we might say to be synchronized with our brethren, all right? And uh, a simple outline of this, we see a calling, first of all, uh, we are called, then we see constraint, and then we see the cause, all right? The, the cause of it. Why are we called to do this? And so hopefully as we go through uh, these verses, the Lord will speak to your heart, encourage you, and instruct you, and uh, it'll be a help to all of us, uh, as it was to me. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord to give us understanding, and then we'll get into these scriptures. Lord, I thank you for this afternoon. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. And Lord, I thank you for those who are faithful to the house of God. And Lord, uh, I know that uh, this is not the uh, the best way uh, of presenting the truth. Lord, I would much rather be preaching this in person. Uh, but Lord, I thank you for the ability uh, to be able to record it and, and share it uh, Lord, with our church family. And I pray that Lord, it will be a great help. And Lord, that you would uh, remove any distractions, uh, even Lord, from the, the video and such, that Lord, there be nothing that would take away or hinder the word of God going forward and speaking to our hearts. Lord, we would listen attentively. Lord, that we're not just listening to a man or, or a recording, but we're listening to the word of God. And Lord, we're listening to you as you speak through the word of God. And that, Lord, you would uh, help us to draw closer to you, uh, Lord, to draw closer to one another, that we would better understand how, Lord, to be separated from the world and, Lord, be separated unto our brethren. And, Lord, in, in the sweet fellowship you give us, Lord, as the family of God. Guide my words and thoughts, Lord, I, I pray for Amy, Lord, as uh, she is still hurting. I pray that, Lord, you would uh, remove this migraine from her, and, Lord, that uh, she would be able to recover well, and, Lord, that uh, she'd be uh, back to strength soon, Lord. Thank you for all these things, and we look forward to what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's go back to uh, verse 14, where James begins to answer the uh, counsel. Uh, notice, first of all, he starts off, he says, Simeon hath declared how God the first did visit the Gentiles. He uses the, the, the name Simeon for Peter. And uh, right away, James, uh, to, to give you some background, uh, James, by this time, he has written the epistle uh, that's in the New Testament. In fact, uh, many believe it was the first epistle written uh, of the um, New Testament. And so, uh, it's being circulated probably. Copies are being handwritten and, and distributed among the saints. And, of course, we know that uh, James believes in not salvation by works, of course, but he believes in uh, a faith without works is dead. And we believe that. Amen. Uh, where does that come from? Uh, James was uh, very steeped in tradition. Uh, he was very Jewish. All right. And so uh, the council, in fact, if you go back... Uh, Let's see, it was uh, back in the first part of the chapter here. Um, I thought it said... I'm not seeing the phrase I'm looking for. Um, I thought it was, it said in the previous verses that they came in the authority of James, but uh, I don't see that, I don't see where they said that uh, offhand. I may have, it's probably there, or maybe I, I'm just, I'm just missing it now. But regardless, 
uh, James was a well-known leader, well-respected leader among the Jews uh, and even the unsaved Jews uh, there in Jerusalem. And these, uh, probably these, uh, the ones that presented this false doctrine were Pharisees that had been saved, and now they've realized that they're losing some of the authority. Uh, they're losing their respect for the Jewish nation uh, and, and the Jews in general among the church because now the Gentiles are coming in and the, uh, the authority, because remember those, those unsaved Pharisees, they were the political and religious power in Israel. And now that uh, they're recognizing it's not just a, a, a faith for the Jews, but Christ died for all the world, then it's not only applicable to the Jews, but to all people. And they're, they're, they're missing out, so to speak. And so uh, they are probably the ones who instigated this false doctrine. And uh, they would have had a lot of respect for James because he uh, was respected for his, uh, his respect of the traditions and things, all right? And so uh, he carries a lot of weight here. Now, coming back to his, his uh, conclusion, back in verse 14, he, he opens up with addressing Peter as Simeon. Simeon is Peter's Jewish name. And so right away we see him trying to uh, put in a little bit of saw, uh, uh, balm, if you will, in, into uh, <clears throat> the wounds of these Pharisees, uh, the, these saved Pharisees, all right? But he's trying to make some reconciliation here. He's appealing to the, his Jewish audience uh, and, and trying to bring them back together and, and reconcile this, this matter, all right? He knows that they're wrong, He's not making any excuse for that. It's very obvious that uh, this is wrong, but he's trying to uh, put a lot of salve in there, all right, and, and bring some healing. And so he addresses Peter as Simeon with his Jewish name. But then notice what he says here, um, verse uh, 14. He says, uh, God did visit the Gentiles uh, to take out of them a people for his name. And that, that phrase there, uh, take out, of them a people. Uh, that, that's the uh, purpose of the church. That right there it embodies what the church is. The ecclesia is the Greek word. It is a called out assembly. And, and there now he, he's going to even reference uh, the Old Testament. He says, to this degree, the words of the prophets, uh, as it is written. And here he's quoting from the book of Amos. Amos chapter 9, uh, verses 11 and 12. He says, after this, I will return it will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who, doth, who doeth all these things. Now, he, he did not quote directly from Amos. It's kind of like a paraphrase. And it's interesting that James uh, here, he takes a scripture from the Old Testament and does a paraphrase, if you will, in the New Testament, all right? Uh, it, it's close enough that we know that's what he's referencing, okay? Uh, and, and there's different reasons behind this. Uh, people don't totally agree with why he did that, but uh, the Holy Spirit recorded as he did here in Acts, all right, whether it's a direct quote or not, uh, it, it is recorded for us here in Acts as it is, and he was referencing uh, this scripture in Amos, which uh, is a prophecy of the millennium, all right? And so uh, what James is doing here, uh, to, long story short, he is not saying that Amos 9, 11, and 12 is fulfilled in the church uh, as far as Gentiles being saved, but he says, uh, he's using it as an argument. He says, if Gentiles, if the Old Testament prophets, which Amos wasn't the only one who said that Gentiles would be saved uh, and, you know, uh, towards the end times, uh, Isaiah prophesied about that. Uh, others prophesied about that. Um, even Solomon, you know, at the opening of the temple, that all the nations would know uh, that I am the Lord. And so, that, that Jehovah is the Lord. Um, God spoke of Gentiles being saved throughout the Old Testament, but the Holy Spirit directed Amos to this reference, to this passage in Amos, and he referenced it here, and he's saying that if Gentiles are going to be saved in the end times, uh, just before the kingdom is initiated and before uh, Christ comes and reestablishes the nation of Israel, then what, should it, what does it mean for us? Why should it matter to us if Gentiles get saved today? If Gentiles are being added to the church now? Um, 
if it's part of God's plan that they be saved in the end, should it not surprise us that Gentiles would be saved in our present day as well? Today, right now? Uh, he, he says, you know, he, he's using that, that logical argument and making it his conclusion here, okay? What does this mean when he says here, uh, what does Amos mean? Well, Amos, let, let's, let's go back and look at it, all right? Hold your place here in Acts. And I don't, I don't want to belabor all of this, but I do want us to understand it, all right? And so let, let's go back to Amos and look at what he quoted or what he, he uh, referenced. Amos chapter 9. And he's, Amos is prophesying about the judgment of uh, Israel. And then he also prophesies about the kingdom, all right? Uh, and, of course, they, they do that very close together, as a lot of the prophets did. That's what Amos did. Uh, verse 9, he says, For lo, I will command, I will sift the house of Israel among all the nations, like as corn is sifted in a, sleep, in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Now, we've seen that taking place. Uh, that happened in Amos' day uh, with the destruction of uh, Jerusalem, uh, 586 B.C., uh, destruction of the uh, temple and all that, the carrying away to Babylon. Uh, the people came back, but then they never were truly a sovereign nation again. They've, always, they've been under rule ever since. And, of course, uh, there are millions of Jews scattered throughout the world, uh, the diaspora. Uh, even in the time of Christ, they were still scattered, all right? So uh, they've still been sifted uh, in a seed, and yet not the least grain has fallen upon the earth. The Lord knows exactly where they all are, and we see it in the present day. You know, this happened a second time in, uh, after Jesus' day, uh, the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70 uh, by the Romans. Uh, again, they were scattered, and they were uh, scattered throughout the earth, all right? And... Um, the, the nation of Israel ceased to exist up until the early, you know, the 20th century, all right, uh, 1945. Uh, 40, and so uh, they, they were scattered, and now verse 10, uh, Amos, he says, All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, The evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. That has not happened. So what you see here in Amos, uh, verse 9, you see the judgment of Israel, and then in verse 10, you see the purification of Israel. All the sinners of the nation of Israel have not died. That is what will happen in the Great Tribulation. At the end of the Great Tribulation, uh, all the Jews, it will be a pure nation. They will uh, no longer uh, be back and forth whether Christ was their Messiah. All the remaining Jews will believe. And of course, uh, thousands and thousands of them will be saved. 144 of them will be evangelists. And uh, not only just any evangelist, but fiery evangelists. Uh, they'll be led by the uh, return of the prophet uh, Moses and Elijah. And they will prophesy in those end times during the, the tribulation time period. And the nation of Israel will not only be preserved physically, but they will be saved spiritually. And uh, they will be purified. And that's what he's speaking of here in verse 10. And then verse 11, and in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David, which is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof. And so in that day, at the end of the great tribulation, Christ is going to come back and establish his kingdom, the millennium. And he's going to rule and reign. And uh, he is going to reign on the uh, throne of David. Uh, the kingdom of Israel will be restored. It will be the sovereign nation that God has always promised it would be over the entire earth. But that's going to happen in the millennium. Uh, at the end of the tribulation. It's not going to happen in the church age, all right? Uh, a lot of people get those things mixed up. Uh, a lot of false doctrine and a lot of denominations are created uh, on the misinterpretation of scriptures like this, all right? Uh, verse 12 says uh, in Amos that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. And so verses 11 and 12 in Amos 9 is what James is referencing back in Acts 15. And he's saying that if God is going to uh, re restore Israel and all the nations of uh, the remnant of Edom and all the heathen, which are called by my name, uh, those are going to be saved in the end, then why are we so against it? Why are we trying to push away from what God's doing among the Gentiles today? 
We need to accept that, that God is not willing that any should perish, uh, even those who are not Jewish, even those among the Gentile uh, nations, that God is willing to save them as well. And uh, he, he's using that argument from Amos then to bring the, a conclusion to the council here in Jerusalem, all right? Um, <clears throat> back in Acts 15, uh, he says, uh, and, and there's, there's a promise here, all right? Uh, he says, verse 16, after this I'll return, we'll build again the tabernacle of David. Again, that, the tabernacle, that's not speaking of a physical building, that's speaking of the nation of Israel. And Amos used that same uh, phrase, the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, linking those two together, all right? Speaking of the nation of Israel, uh, he says, I will build again the nation. Uh, the tabernacle of David has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. You know, right here we see there's a promise that God hasn't forgotten the nation of Israel. Amen. And even James in the early church, uh, even though that they had rejected the kingdom, they had rejected it more than once now, uh, God has not forgotten the nation of Israel. And God is still uh, going to redeem Israel, uh, both physically and spiritually, and God's going to give them an inheritance as he's promised them. Amen. Uh, Christ is going to come back and rule and reign. And James recognized that. Um, and I'll point out, to, uh, you know, James recognized that the church is different than Israel. Uh, back up in verse 14, when he said to take them out, uh, uh, take out of them a people for his name. He, he, James recognized that God was calling out a people uh, from the Gentiles as well as from the Jews. James recognized that uh, the church was not just something for the Jews. It was not a Jewish church. It was not a Gentile church. It is the church. Amen? Uh, our church is a good example of that. You know, uh, we've got Kiwis. We've got Americans. Uh, we've got Filipinos. Uh, I'm going to forget somebody. All right? But uh, we've got all kinds of people groups, and, and we come from different backgrounds, but that doesn't matter. In the church, we are the church. And we are a called out people for his name. Amen. Uh, we are a group of believers that our nationalities do not matter. But what matters is our common bond and the faith of Jesus Christ. And we are the family of God. And so we are bound together. That's what James was trying to help the people at Jerusalem to help these, uh, these saved Pharisees, if you will, coming out of Judaism to realize you don't need Judaism anymore. And we don't identify with the traditions of the past anymore. We are now a new people. Uh, God has called the, the Gentiles out just like he's called us out of Judaism. We don't need to you know, drag Judaism uh, along with us into the church. No, this is something entirely new, entirely different. We are a called out people. Amen. Um, look at, uh, uh, I was going to mention this later. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. All right, we'll go ahead and go here. 1 Corinthians 10. And we'll probably uh, come back here a little bit later uh, at another point, but I want you to look at a scripture here uh, now. Uh, look at verse 32. Here, Paul, he's writing to the church of Corinth, and he says, Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Right there, Paul, under inspiration, identifies three people groups. He says, uh, we're not to give offense to the Jews, number one, so the, to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. We're not to give offense to the, Jew, to the Gentiles, the unsaved Gentiles. Uh, those are all the other nations. And he says, nor to the church. And so if you're saved, you're a part of the church. And we're not part of the Jews. We're not part of the Gentiles. We are the church. Amen. Now you say, well, Pastor, I didn't give up my, my citizenship when I, when I become a Christian. Um, <clears throat> not physically, but spiritually you did. Amen. <laughs> uh, we are pilgrims on this earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. Uh, we, we hold a title that is a heavenly title. Amen. And uh, we are just pilgrims and, and sojourners on this land. 
Uh, we, we seek a heavenly reward. Amen? And so here, that's what James is trying to uh, get across to the council of Jerusalem, that God is calling out a people that is different from the Jewish nation, that's different from all the Gentile nations. Uh, we are the church. We are a holy nation. Uh, that we should show forth the praises of him, as Peter would write later in his epistle, all right? Uh, and so uh, we are called out. We see our calling here uh, that uh, James speaks of. And so then, uh, verse 17, he says that the residue of men might seek after the Lord of all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, uh, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Again, he's referencing back to uh, Amos, but... Here he's making the application, this is the purpose of the calling. This is why we're calling out. That the residue, that the remnant, which uh, the direct interpretation of that is those that are left, those that endure the great tribulation, all right, those that were unsaved and, and go into the tribulation, and those that live through the tribulation, which will be very few, all right, but there'll be a residue, there'll, there'll be a, a, a remnant of Gentiles, all right, there will be Gentiles saved, uh, in the tribulation, and he says that those will seek after the Lord, uh, and they'll be saved. Well, that's the purpose of the calling out today. The application is God is calling out people. God is uh, allowing Gentiles to be saved so that they can see the power of God to save all mankind. The, the reason that God saved you is so that he could demonstrate the power and the grace and his love in your life to somebody else. He, he wants the world to see that there is hope, there is peace, there is forgiveness, that you don't have to live enslaved to sin, you don't have to live without hope, that you can be saved. You know, if um, God didn't call us out to be a witness, then he'd just take us straight to heaven. Uh, but but he, that's not the case. <laughs> we're still here, amen? And as long as we're here, he wants us to occupy until he comes. He wants us to be that witness, that light, uh, and, and to be... A, a difference in this world and to demonstrate to the, the world that we can be changed. Amen. That they can be changed as well. Uh, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles. Uh, and then he says in verse 17, who the Lord, uh, the Lord who doeth all these things. Uh, again, James recognized the sovereignty of God in all these things. He said, it's the Lord that's doing this thing. Uh, we may not have chosen to do it this way, uh, you as former Pharisees under the Old Testament law, you may not have chosen to seek out Gentiles to be saved. Uh, even Peter, the, the apostle, he didn't seek after uh, Cornelius. God had to speak to him in a vision and three times had to confirm it and uh, make sure that he had witnesses to go with him to verify what God was doing. This was a strange thing to these Jews. And to, to see Gentiles getting saved... That, that was something foreign to them. But James, he says, this is the Lord who doeth all these things. God is in control of this. In the same way that we have to trust God that one day he's going to restore the nation of Israel to sovereignty and to power, uh, and that Christ is going to come back and, and, and restore the kingdom, we have to trust God that Gentiles can be saved. And that they get saved the same way that we've been saved. It's by grace, through faith, uh, uh, by faith and repentance. Uh, and, and we see the Spirit of God poured upon on, on them just like it was poured out upon us. And so he recognizes the sovereignty of God in Gentiles being saved in verse 17. Uh, <clears throat> verse 18 as well, he says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He says, this has been the plan of God all along. This, this, we can't doubt the sovereignty of God. God is at work here. And so we see the called out assembly uh, of Jews and Gentiles. Amen. Uh, we are set apart unto God uh, from the world. So verse 19, then he says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. And I, I like how he says it even here. He says that they are turned from the Gentiles to God. Again, it, it speaks of a calling out, all right, a separation. We are called out from the Gentiles, uh, from the lost, unto God. Later, Paul would write to the, the church in Thessalonica that you turn uh, from idols to serve the living God. And that, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to turn away from uh, false religions, all right, from, from worshiping ourselves, from worshiping, uh, uh, seeking other religion, and we're supposed to turn to Jesus Christ. 
Amen. And that's exactly what salvation is. That's faith and repentance. You repent uh, from idolatry, uh, from uh, trying to save yourself, and you recognize your need to be saved, and you turn to Jesus Christ. That's repentance and faith. All right, two sides of the same coin. And I I'm covering a lot, and uh, probably cover more than I need to. All right, but uh, th that's the picture here. I call it out assembly. All right, and he says though that we should trouble them not. Verse nineteen. My sentence is, my, my conclusion, this is what I declare, we trouble not them. Now, the word trouble, uh, it, it's a word, it means to annoy, all right, uh, to, to pester. And he's saying, we don't need to annoy them, we don't need to uh, make things difficult for them uh, that, that have been saved. They have turned from idolatry, they've turned from the Gentile world, they've turned to God, they've turned to Jesus Christ for faith, we don't need to make... It more difficult. And that's exactly what uh, uh, these uh, teachers, these false teachers uh, in, in the church were doing, saying that you had to add circumcision, that you had to follow Moses, that you had to you know, obey the Old Testament in order to prove your salvation. He says, you're frustrating the grace of God. That's what Paul would say to the Galatians. Here, uh, James, he says, you're troubling them. You're annoying them. You're making things difficult. Things are going to be hard enough. We don't need to try to, you know, Make them prove it, right? Uh, and, boy, this carried a lot of weight coming from James. Remember, James is the one who wrote the epistle, uh, which was already penned by this time. It said, faith without works is dead. Wow. You mean James who said that you've got to show me your faith by my works? Now he's telling the church, don't trouble the Gentiles. Don't make it too hard for them. You see the balance here. James recognized the importance of coming apart and being separated, but he also recognized the danger of adding works to grace. He said, don't trouble the grace of God. Don't frustrate the grace of God. Don't make it so difficult that they don't want to be saved, and, and don't make it so difficult that they think they have to earn their salvation and prove their salvation to us. They have nothing to prove to us. The same is true of us today. Amen? Amen. Uh, we, we don't need to prove ourselves to mankind in order to earn our salvation. All we have to prove is to prove our faith before God. How do we do that? We call upon his name. Amen. It's salvation by grace, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing more, nothing less. Amen. He says, don't trouble them. Trouble not them. Verse 20, though, he says, But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication, from things strangled and from blood. Now, you would say, and, and I would say this even all right, in the initial reading of this, well, if he doesn't want to trouble them, why is he adding these, these, these rules right here? <laughs> James, you're talking out of two sides of, of your mouth here, uh, both sides at the same time. Uh, you say not to trouble them, and then you say, so we're just going to add four things. We just want to do this. You know, you, they just need to do these four things, uh, that they do these things. All right. So what is he talking about here? Uh, with, with the constraint. Well, there's difference of opinion as to where these come from. Um, some believe that these things he lists are reference, uh, they are very specific commands uh, from the Old Testament, all right? And we, we'll look at some of that. Uh, some believe these are rooted in uh, covenants given before the Old Testament law, uh, back with the Noah. Uh, the covenant with Noah, the Noahic covenant, all right? Um, regardless, they are not given as commands. They're not given, that, that, I think that's the key to this here, okay? Um, uh, you, you see here in verse 20, he says that they abstain from pollution of idols and, and from these other three things. The word abstain is not a commandment. It means to refrain. It means to uh, not be associated with. Now, I, I want to show you a, a cross-reference and uh, show you the difference, okay? Uh, stay, you know, hold your place here, but go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, just keep in mind the time difference, all right? Acts 15 is the early church. Uh, Acts 15, this is probably, uh, some would say this is around 50 A.D., so... Um, 20, 25 years after Christ 
uh, resurrected after the ascension and such. All right, so a very early time in the church. All right, uh, a very early time, or earlier than what I, I originally thought. Okay, but this is very early, a very young church here in Acts 15. Now we go to First Timothy 4. This is another 20 plus years later. All right, uh, and, and uh, Paul is instructing Timothy, who's pastor of the church at Ephesus, and he warns them. He warns Timothy uh, about those. Uh, false teachers. Look at 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. He says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now, the key here is verse 3. They say forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Uh, the word forbidding there, it means to fight off. They're going to force you to do this. Uh, that it's not just they're saying this. They're going to make you do this. And so this has, uh, these false teachers are forcing their doctrine upon you. It, it is compulsory. And not only are they uh, forcing you to be celibate, they're forcing you to abstain from meats. Now, James, God directed him at the Council of Jerusalem to suggest they refrain from uh, the pollution of uh, idols and from uh, things strangled and from blood. It's a, a, a refrain. The word refrain, or the, the word, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the word Abstain, verse 20, is the same word used here in 1 Timothy 4, 3, to abstain from meats. And it means that you don't associate with that. All right? It is a suggestion. And here, the, the problem is, in 1 Timothy 4, is the false teachers take that, they take the suggestion, that they take the principle of separation and force it upon people. This is legalism. That's exactly what it is. It's legalism. It's work salvation. Saying, if you don't do that, then you're not saved. And saying to uh, pastors and leadership that if you want to be a leader in the church, you want to be an elder, you can't be married. They're forbidding them to marry. And, and you know, saying that if you're truly godly, uh, you're, you're going to be separated even from uh, your... Uh, <clears throat> can't think of the right word, uh, but physical relationships, you're not going to be uh, related to, you know, have a, uh, a, a family, you're going to be distanced from your own family, uh, you know, th this is uh, the, the beginnings of uh, monasteries here, all right, uh, nuns and uh, monks, all right, uh, this is exactly what the Catholic Church teaches, all right, and uh, to, to name names, all right, uh, forbidding to marry, then a lot of priests to be married, monks aren't to be married, all right, same thing with nuns. Uh, abstaining from meats, that's Lent, the season of Lent, all right? So this is exactly what the Catholic Church teaches. Uh, very clearly pinpoints the doctrine of the Catholic Church as false teachings, all right? But that's exactly what Paul was confronting to Timothy right here in, in the first century of the church, all right? And they took the principle that God gave at the Council of Jerusalem to abstain, to the, the principle of separation, to not be associated with these things, and we're going to look at exactly what they are, okay? But that principle of separation, and they made it a commandment. They made it into a law. They said that we're going to force this upon you, that if you don't do these things, then you're not truly godly, and that you, you may not even be saved because you're not doing these things, which the Council of Jerusalem said had to be done. Wait a minute. That's not what, that's not what James said here. He's saying we, we don't want to trouble them, but we're going to suggest to them that they abstain from these things. And by abstaining, that they not be associated with those things. All right. Now, another thing we have to remember in church history is that, uh, again, this is the early church in Acts 15. And they didn't have everything that we have after Acts 15. They didn't have, all they had was the book of James. They didn't have the New Testament. And so they're still being guided primarily by principles in the Old Testament and by the Holy Spirit's application in the New. And, and the Holy Spirit's application in their present day. 
and of course verifying it with signs and wonders and all those the New Testament sign gifts. All right. So uh, there's a, a different um, time period that we're looking at here. Okay. Uh, they didn't have the rest of the New Testament yet. Uh, they had probably just one book at, at best, and so uh, they were being guided mostly by the Holy Spirit and, and the word that He would give directly to the apostles. And of course, uh, later they would write those words down. Amen. Uh, the Holy Spirit would bring all those things into remembrance that Christ had taught them and uh, give us the, the, the word of God. But here, uh, this is what James says. Not that it's commanded, but it is a principle of separation. That we uh, abstain from these things. Not be associated with these things. So what is it? The pollution of idols, from fornication, things strangled, and from blood. Obviously, the pollution of idols, he's speaking of idolatry, all right? And uh, th these things are things that will be common to the Gentile world. And here, uh, the, the Gentiles, in contrast to the Jews, Gentiles worshipped all kinds of gods. The Jews had one temple. They had the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, the Gentile world had all kinds of temples all over. They worshipped all kinds of gods. Uh, the, the Roman Empire had embraced Greek culture and spread it all over the world, all over the known world. And the Greeks had all kinds of gods. And they worshipped gods for all different reasons, uh, to, to seek all different kinds of uh, things in, in the supernatural world. And, of course, uh, the god of this world, Satan himself, had blinded their eyes by that and, and given them spiritual powers, all right? Not, uh, I, I should say, supernatural powers, not spiritual, all right? But... Uh, uh, they you know, uh, involved in all kinds of false worship. And James, he says, you need to distance yourself from that. Now, we're speaking about saved people. So we're not saying that these Christians, it's okay for them to still worship their idols. No, they've already forsook their idols. It's not a matter of you have to, you know, if you can do both. It's a principle of separation he's saying yes you have forsook your idols you, you've repented and you've turned by faith to christ now you don't need to associate with that and how you do that is up to you but we need to abstain from the pollution of idols don't be associated with your former way of worship don't be associated with the former worship of the world don't be associated with those former gods uh, distance yourself, have a separation from the pollution of idols. Not only that, not only um, idolatry, but he says from fornication. Now this is, in, this is an interesting uh, word uh, and it has a different um, uh, background. All right, People have different ideas as to where this comes from. Um, I believe this comes from Leviticus chapter 18 and uh, we won't take time to take the time to turn there. I feel like I'm, I'm really uh, going uh, into a lot of detail here. Right? But there, there's a lot to, to dig, okay? But uh, this is not the common word uh, in the Greek that we see for fornication. Uh, this is a, a word that's only used a few times in, in the scripture. Uh, this is the word that Jesus used in Matthew 19 where he gave the exception clause for divorce. And that, that is a whole other uh, subject. Uh, that I am going to preach on uh, when the Lord gives me liberty. But I, I've been doing some study uh, for other things uh, about marriage and, and divorce. And it's very interesting, that word. Uh, but it's the same word that Jesus used. And the exception clause, uh, by the way, uh, is a very, very narrow exception. And none of us would be, um, it wouldn't apply to any of us, okay? <laughs> So um, just, just to clarify that, all right? But um, it is the same word, and it's speaking of not just immorality, all right? If I can say it that way without um, uh, going into you know, excessive details, but it is uh, eccentric immorality. It, it is uh, very, very debased immorality and, and real, uh, sexual relationships here. And he's saying, of course, that is something that, again, the Gentile world, it was common. It was common. Okay? Uh, what, was there immorality among the Jews? Sure there was. That's why they debated divorce with Jesus. But they would go about doing it the legal way.
Okay, the Pharisees uh, would take and twist the scriptures and, and uh, divorce and commit immorality in a legal way. All right, uh, the Gentiles who had no law, they didn't care, <laughs> and they would go about uh, and, and go living immoral lives however they pleased, and all kinds of incestuous relationships. And here, James, he's saying, you need to abstain. You need to separate, a principle of separation. Don't be associated with that kind of immorality. Now, boy, there's a principle for us there, all right? Yes, we know the commands uh, of Scripture. Uh, we're to remain pure. We're separate under God. We know that God has given us uh, the marriage relationship, uh, uh, one woman, one man together for life, amen? And yet, there is a principle of separation. We do not know need to associate with the wicked immorality, the, the lewdness of the Gentile world. And, and sad to say, we see that around us everywhere. Now, Jesus told us we're uh, in the world, but we're not to be of the world. Amen? Uh, we, we can't just you know, build a monastery and, and you know, have our little Christian compound and everything be Christian and, and never see the world. No, we, we can't do that. All right? But, you know, we ought not be associated with... Uh, the, the lewdness and immorality of the world. You say, Pastor, how do, we, how do we do that? The way we dress, what we talk about, uh, places we go, um, what we watch on TV. Yeah, that's what we associate with, and if that's what we're associating with, and that's how we're identified by the unsaved, you say, well, he's no different than I am. He watches the same shows I do. He makes the same dirty jokes that I do at work. He, he, he thinks it's funny just like I do. You know, he, uh, he talks about his wife the way I talk about my, my partner, you know, and uh, nothing different. That ought not be. You know, if, if, ladies, if you gossip about your husband the same way that other ladies, unsaved ladies gossip about their husbands and, and, and talk down their man, uh, then you're associating with the world. And, and even though you might be married and, and you're not divorced, you're still living together, um, you're, you're distancing yourself uh, from him by associating with them and, and, and the way that they uh, uh, downgrade the leadership in the home. And uh, like I said, that, that's a whole other subject, all right? But here, th this is what um, James is referring to. He says, abstain, distance yourself from the immorality, the lewdness of the world, all right? Be separated from that. Uh, show constraint here, okay? And then he says, from things strangled and from blood. And these are these are two things kind of brought, you could bring it under one umbrella, okay? Uh, he's speaking of the blood. And, and most commentators believe this goes back to the Noahic covenant. And there in uh, Genesis, and I believe it's chapter 9, we won't go there for time's sake, but God told Noah that mankind could now eat flesh. And praise the, praise the Lord for that, amen. Uh, we can eat meat. Uh, we, can, we don't have to have veggie burgers, all right? Uh, we don't have to have a you know, salad. I, I'm not a rabbit, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, my, my cows eat all, all my vegetables, and then I eat the cow, amen? And that's the way I like it. Um, <clears throat> but the, the uh, restriction on that was, in Noah's day, was that the, not to eat the blood. That had the blood removed. And of course, then that was uh, added into the uh, law of Moses, all right? Uh, the blood was to be drained. And why was that? Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And God values the blood. God value, Because God values life. Amen? And we see the value of life here. And uh, in the Gentile world, they're, they're unfamiliar with the ways of God. They're unfamiliar with the ways of Jehovah. Uh, they would eat Meat without draining the blood. They, they didn't give a second thought, okay? Um, the idea here about how things strangled, it means that it was not, uh, blood, the blood was not let out. Right? It, it died from, from being strangled. It died from, you know, some other way from bloodletting. And so it would still contain the blood in the animal. And here, uh, James, he's saying, be distanced from that. Don't be associated with that. Separate yourself from, from that type of uh, <clears throat> uh, acts. And, and it's interesting then to see how uh, these three principles of separation 
this became the foundation for a lot of what is written into our New Testament. All right? Uh, you see these issues addressed in 1 and 2 Corinthians a lot. And, and it was taken up not by James, but by Paul, the apostle. The one that you would think would um, you know, be all against uh, adding works to salvation, which he was. All right, uh, The same one who wrote the book of Galatians and said that Christ is the end of the law is the same one who wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians who said that you should not be, offering, you should not be uh, eating meat offered unto idols. And you need to uh, be set apart unto God, uh, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, all right? And, and you need to be separated. And so, again, we have to remember that this was given, Acts 15 is given, before the New Testament has been written. And so, a lot of what we have in the New Testament time period, a lot of those epistles were based upon these three principles. This principle of separation, separation from idolatry, separation from immorality, and separation from... Uh, uh, the eating of meat, all right, the, with, with the blood, containing blood, all right? And so there is this um, principle of constraint, this principle of separation. This is love, not legalism, okay? Uh, this is love and not license. Th this is the opposite of legalism. This is the request of the pastor at the Church of Jerusalem, uh, James, uh, the pastor of a primarily Jewish congregation, asking the Gentile Christians to show a little restraint and, and, and be willing to distance themselves from their old ways in order to be able to fellowship with his congregation, primarily Jewish people. He says, if we're going to bridge this gap as a new people, as a called out people, as people that are not associated with the Old Testament and, and the ways of Judaism. And we also need to not be associated with the ways of the Gentiles. We're a totally new people. Amen. We are peculiar people. Uh, we're not like the Gentile world. We're not like the Jews world. We are gods. Amen. A holy nation. A called out people from all people groups. Not just from the Jews. Not just from the Gentiles. We are set apart as gods. Amen. And, and we need to separate ourselves from the, from the old ways of, of religion. You, you, you former Pharisees, you former Jews, uh, we need to distance ourselves from, from the ways of Moses and come apart unto God. You former Gentiles that have been saved of idolatry and immorality, you need to distance yourself from those ways and come apart unto God. As we come apart from those separate ways, we'll come together as one body in Christ. Amen. And that is, that is what he's trying to draw together here. And that's what we see then the cause of it all. All right. Uh, look at verse 21. He says, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day. Again, James, he's trying to bring together these two groups in, into one body. And under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, here he says, Moses is preached in, in the synagogues all around the world. He says, There are Jews that know the Old Testament, and hopefully they're going to get saved. And yet, they're going to be getting saved out of Judaism. And when they see these Gentiles that are getting saved, and, and if they don't see them coming apart like they're coming apart from their old religions, then they're going to question your salvation. And it's not that you have to do this in order to get saved, but for the sake of fellowship, for the sake of unity, you need to come together. Amen? And, and, and be separated as a body together. And, and distance yourself from these things that we've, we've mentioned. Uh, turn over again to 1 Corinthians 10. And, and we'll conclude it. I hope this has not been... Uh, this, in some ways, there's a lot to chew on. And uh, again, I wish I was here preaching it in person. Um, but uh, hopefully the Lord has uh, made some things clear in, in our minds. Amen? Uh, here, again, Paul is addressing some of these same issues just a few years later, all right, to the church at Corinth. And he says, uh, he's speaking of uh, worshiping uh, or eating of meats, all right. Uh, here he says, verse 31, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And then verse 32 is the one we read a while ago, that we give not offense 
to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Uh, <clears throat> Paul, he said, the overall principle is that we not do it to please ourselves. You may have the liberty to do it. It may not be that there's a command against, you know, going certain places. It may not be that, uh, that, that there's a, a, you know, command to do certain things. But just out of love for your brethren and, and seeking to have unity, then you would not do those things. Or you would step up and do those things even though you don't feel like it's something you have to do. You know, and, and, and the principle is to preferring one another. That we would do everything to the glory of God. That's what it's all about. Giving, giving God glory in everything we do. That that's a principle that we need to uh, use. And that really is one of the um, uh, benchmarks, we could say. One, one of the uh, standards that we can use for every area of life. Can I do this and bring glory to God? When I, when, I'm, when I go there, am I bringing glory to God? You say, well, Pastor, yeah, how do you apply that to everything? I mean, how do you apply that to, to building houses? <laughs> well, can you do that and it be honoring to God? You provide it for your family? You do it in a way that's pleasing to the Lord? Uh, you, you have a testimony among the unsaved world that, hey, we can do the job right and, and get the job done on time and, and you know, do it in a respectable way and, and, and an honoring way. Uh, hey, that's giving glory to God. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, going to a, uh, uh, a ball game. Hey, does that bring glory to God? Well, why are you going? Are you, are you going there so you can, you can go and just, you know, be a part of the crowd? Are, are you going there maybe to spend time with, you know, build relationships with people that, are important to you? Are, are you going there to maybe uh, relax and, and give yourself a break? Hey, God, God tells us to do those kind of things. All right, uh, it, it comes back to the heart of the matter. All right, again, James in Acts 15 was not writing commandments; he was giving principles, and principles is what guides the heart. And, and, and principles is what guards uh, guides our heart, and then that directs our actions. Okay. He wasn't just telling us, you, you do this and do this, and you don't do that. That's legalism. He was giving us principles of separation. And then, of course, uh, Paul built upon that uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians here. So that whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's the cause. The glory of God. Amen? That's our cause here as a church, that we exalt the Savior. Amen? Everything we do is to exalt the Savior. Uh, yesterday... We distribute 2,100, John and Romans, <laughs> in four hours. Praise God. That is to the glory of God. Amen. Uh, we're not, you know, building a name for ourselves. Uh, we're not building up, you know, we're not trying to pat ourselves on the back. We're trying to exalt the Savior. Amen. Um, everything we do, whether it's something we do at church, whether it's something we do in our homes, you know, what we watch on TV, can we do that and honor God? What we do with our families. Can we, can we take our family here and honor God? Uh, again, what we do at work. Can we, can we work in this place and honor God? Can we work in this way and honor God? You know, what serve you do? Whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Amen. That is the cause. And as we seek to please God first, then everything else will fall in place. And verse 32 uh, will we'll apply. That will we'll give not offense to the Jews, to the Gentiles, or to the church of God. When we seek to glorify God first, all those other relationships are going to fall right in place. And we won't be doing giving offense. So, Pastor, you can't please everybody all the time. No, you can't. But you can please God all the time. And if you please God all the time, you don't have to worry about pleasing everybody else. Because they'll all fall in line. So, here we see... Again, uh, a simple outline, but a, a lot to, to think on, all right? We see in Acts 15 that we are called out. Uh, we're to be separate. We're not to follow the ways of uh, the Old Testament, uh, Judaism, all right? The, those Jews, they were saved out of that, and they're supposed to come apart from that. But then we also see that the Gentiles were to show constraint and be separated unto God and separated from uh, the, these things that were so pro prominent 
in the Gentile world from the worship of idolatry, from uh, the uh, fornication and immorality, and from uh, the eating of meats uh, with, with blood, all right, and, and things offered unto idols. And so we're to come together away from the unsaved world, away from the wickedness of the world, away from the teaching of religion, all right, and, and work salvation. We, we apply it that way and come together in faith in Christ as one body. Amen. And uh, Paul summarized it there in, in Ephesians that uh, in Christ is neither Jew nor Gentile. Amen. Uh, we are one body in Christ. Uh, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Amen. And that's how God sees us, and that's how God wants us to work together. Amen. As a body of Christ. We are called to be separated from the world and separated unto Christ and in turn our brethren in Christ. Amen. Let's seek to be uh, one in Christ. Let's seek to be uh, in sync with our brothers. Amen. And be in fellowship. Uh, let, let, let's seek to uh, do all things for the glory of God. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for, for this passage here in Acts 15. I know that, Lord, there's a lot of involved here, and Lord, covered a lot of different areas, but Lord, I pray that it's been a help. Lord, you've given us understanding, and Lord, now you'd help us to make the application in our lives. Lord, uh, these are principles that need to guide everything we do. And Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, that Lord, we would keep these uh, in our mind, in our heart, that, Lord, we would seek to do it all for the glory of God. That, Lord, we would seek to live a separated life, not just to be different, but, Lord, that we would live our lives unto you. And, Lord, that we would see you honored and glorified. That, Lord, as James made the application there, the residue, Lord, of all the Gentiles, would see that, Lord, we are different. And, Lord, that they would want to be saved. Lord, they would want to be changed the same way that you've changed us. Help us, we pray, to be that salt and light be a different people, to be your people in a lost and dark world. In Jesus' name.